So this lecture today uh, is going to introduce a topic that is actually uh, um, a rather useful tool, uh, namely the notion of uh, ensembles and uh, boosting. So our plan for today is uh, first we'll look at boosting and we'll see what boosting is and uh, um, you know what's this general idea of uh, uh, combining multiple classifiers together. We'll look at uh, this algorithm called add a boost in some amount of detail. And then finally, uh, I'm going to um, kind of broaden this uh, topic uh, by talking about ensemble methods in general and talk about uh, things like random forests and bagging and such things. And uh, one thing that I'll, I'll probably mention this again at the end, but uh, the use of ensembles is actually extremely, uh, a, a, ensembles are a rather useful tool. Um, and it's probably worth understanding this and keeping this in your toolkit because uh, uh, they tend to uh, really invariably um, improve accuracy when you are uh, predictive accuracy in the end. So it's a useful tool to keep in uh, mind. So let's get started. Let's start with what's boosting and then move on. Um, uh, boosting is a general uh, approach for constructing what's called a strong learner by piecing together a collection of many, many, uh, in theory, infinite weak learners. And uh, it has an inter in the, the history of boosting has an intimate connection with uh, pack theory that we've seen in class before. So uh, just to remind you, uh, pack learning or probably approximately correct learning was uh, introduced, uh, the framework was introduced in a 19, um, 84 paper, uh, uh, and uh, it, 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 and very soon after that, there was a theoretical question that we'll see, and uh, the answer to that question was uh, 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 was this algorithm called boosting, or this idea called boosting. Well, let's uh, look at what the details are. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to point out that boosting is a practically useful method. It's a way of creating a strong classifier using a collection of weak classifiers. In fact, these weak classifiers could be so weak that they could just be rules of thumb that are combined together. But it also serves as a good example of a collection of methods called ensembles. Uh, there are ensemble methods are a class of learning algorithms. It's essentially, uh, uh, think of it as a meta algorithm. Um, or a, a higher level technique uh, that combines other classifiers um, uh, to construct a consensus classifier. Um, and it, it just so happens that boosting is one of these uh, ensemble methods and it comes with theoretical guarantees. So to illustrate this idea of boosting, I'm going to use uh, uh, some material that was uh, created by Rob Shapir and this is uh, at least maybe uh, 20 plus years old, uh, or even if not more, and you will see that the example is a bit dated. Imagine that we have this uh, uh, hotline system or a phone uh, customer service system where uh, uh, you pick up the call, phone and you, uh, um, you, you say something and it gets automatically routed to a certain uh, a certain desk if you want. So if you want to say, I'd like to place a collect call, it goes to this desk, uh, to this system called collect. Um, if you don't know what a collect call is, uh, um, that just means that uh, you are younger than at a boost. Um, and you can, uh, if you want, you could say uh, operator make a call, bill it to my office. That means that uh, this, uh, uh, this thing gets routed to this classified as third number. If you want to place a call, but charge something, then uh, uh, it has to be classified. Uh, essentially, these are just class labels. The question is, let's say I want to build this classifier that takes some text um, of this kind and converts it into a label of this kind. How do I do it? Now, notice that in general, I mean, if, if, if imagine that you don't know anything about machine learning, you just had to build this program that had to categorize things. You might notice that uh, if the person says MasterCard, then there's a good chance that uh, it might be something like collect uh, a calling card. 
If the person says, if the text of the call had the word collect in it, then it must be this category here and so on. So you can write these little programs, these little rules. These rules are rules of thumb. And these rules of thumb are surprisingly correct. However, they're not always perfect. So there, there might be this, uh, uh, you know, there might be this problem of uh, how do I create this uh, system that is good using only these rules of thumb? So how do I combine all these rules of thumb into a single prediction rule that covers all the cases? This might be a hard problem. And this is where it becomes a learning problem. So one way of doing and the, the one way of doing this is uh, uh, this notion of boosting. Essentially, you want to boost the accuracy of many rules of thumb. One way of doing this is maybe you select uh, a small set of examples, uh, you stare at them hard, and you invent a certain rule of thumb. Then you find another subset of examples, um, you get another rule of thumb. You do this many many times. You do this t times. You get uh, t uh, rules. And then once you have this, you combine all of these into a single prediction rule. We've not talked about how to do it, but uh, we'll spend some time talking about this. The real question is, how do you select these subsets and how do you combine them? If you are able to answer this question, these two questions, at least in theory, you have, a, uh, you have an ensemble approach. You are uh, this is essentially the, uh, the general schema for most ensemble methods. So uh, boosting is a general algorithm that uh, converts these kinds of rough rules of thumb into accurate classifiers. Let's, uh, let's look at the history of this thing first before we talk about uh, this, uh, the actual algorithm for boosting. Uh, just to remind you, uh, we've seen uh, PAC uh, learning, and we know what a path algorithm is. Today, we are going to call what we saw before uh, as a strong path algorithm. A path algorithm, or in this case, a strong path algorithm, is one which, uh, no matter which distribution uh, uh, exists over the training examples, remember, it's a fixed but unknown distribution, for any epsilon and delta, given a uh, polynomial number of samples, polynomial and what, in one over epsilon, one over delta, and size of the hypothesis space and such things, um, and the three dimensionality. Given any uh, epsilon and delta and a polynomial number of randomly selected examples, this strong pack algorithm will find a hypothesis whose error is less than epsilon, but it won't, it's not guaranteed to always do this. It finds such a classifier with high probability, with probability one minus uh, delta. So the important thing here is it's going to find a classifier with a small error. And this is true for any epsilon, for any error uh, that is uh, greater than zero. In particular, this means that I could demand that my epsilon is really, really tiny. I could demand that my epsilon is 0 0.001. This corresponds to a 99 0.9% accurate classifier. I could insist that the only classifier that makes me happy is one that whose uh, accuracy is at least 99.9%. What if my algorithm cannot guarantee that? What if instead I have an algorithm that gets me a classifier that is just slightly better than chance? Um, we, we call such, a, we are going to today, uh, in the context of boosting, we are going to call such things a weak fat algorithm. I might be able to write uh, an algorithm that does this, uh, but it only gives me a classifier whose accuracy is, uh, whose epsilon, the error, not accuracy, is uh, more than half minus gamma for some small gamma. What does that mean? When gamma is 0 0.01, for example, I want that this algorithm will give me a classifier whose error is more than uh, 0.49. That doesn't seem particularly great, Remember, lower error is better, but all this algorithm guarantees is uh, you'll get an algorithm whose accuracy, I'm using accuracy now, is 51%. In 49% of the examples, it will make a mistake. In uh, like at least 49% of the examples, it will make a mistake. So at, at best, we can expect an accuracy of 
assuming that uh, labels are uh, equally equally likely, equally uh, distributed across the examples, this is a uh, the, a weak pack algorithm is one that guarantees a classifier that is slightly better than chance. That's all we get. So the, the big difference between these two is uh, this is true, a, a strong pack algorithm or you know, a pack algorithm uh, requires these, uh, the, the guarantees, this guarantee for every epsilon, whereas this one, a weak pack algorithm um, can only do that for uh, something that is uh, epsilon that's slightly better than chance. So then this raises an interesting question. And uh, in fact, uh, this question was uh, posed by a paper by Michael Kearns and Leslie Valiant in 1988. Suppose I have a concept class where I know there is a weak pack algorithm. In fact, not only do I know there's a weak pack algorithm, I have the weak pack algorithm. If this happens, does this mean that uh, this concept class is learnable in the strong sense? In the, uh, the, that means if there exists a, an algorithm for which it guarantees an error uh, more than that slightly better than chance, does this mean I can make the error arbitrarily small? Maybe I don't have the algorithm. Does there exist an algorithm for which the error is arbitrarily small? This was a theoretical question. This was just um, uh, an interesting uh, puzzle, if you want, that was raised in this paper by Kearns and Valiant. Does weak learnability imply strong learnability? Um, the entire agenda of the research in boosting essentially stemmed from this uh, theoretical question. So uh, just as a matter of history, uh, very soon after uh, this paper was written by Kearns and Valiant, which came out in 1988, um, uh, Rob Shapir wrote, uh, showed that, uh, yes, weak learnability does imply strong learnability. And he did, he did this using a by in showing a provable boosting algorithm that essentially called the weak learner three times on three different, by modifying the distribution over the data. And every time you'd get a slight improvement in accuracy. And this uh, means that I can keep doing this again and again. And uh, um, you, you get a strong uh, learning algorithm. Uh, your Freund uh, showed in 1990 that uh, there's an optimal algorithm that boosts by majority. And uh, then they combined forces. Actually, uh, there were also some uh, early experiments around boosting. Uh, but unfortunately, using the techniques that had been developed till then were not particularly good from the efficiency point of view. They were not practical algorithms. They were just uh, these theoretical objects. Uh, uh, in 95, Freund and Shapir combined forces and introduced this algorithm called Adaboost, which was uh, essentially built upon these previous ideas and uh, it had strong uh, practical advantages. This is what we'll be seeing later. So it took a solid, uh, the question was raised in 1988 uh, and it took like uh, a good seven years till this answer was, uh, till we got a practical algorithm that answered the question conclusively. Um, it was followed by a whole bunch of papers uh, and practical applications. And also uh, about uh, uh, eight years later, Freund and Shapir got a Godel prize. So there's something to say about uh, persisting with a research question and uh, seeing it through. So this is the history of boosting. Uh, the plan, the, what we're going to do now is uh, go we're going to look at the add a boost algorithm in some detail. We'll first see what's the intuition. We'll look at uh, the actual mechanics of the algorithm. And then I'll talk about why it works. And I'll point you to the proof. We won't go over the proof in, the, in this lecture. So let's first see a toy example. And this example, again, is uh, from, uh, uh, I think, the lecture by Freund or Shapir. I forget. Um, so we have this toy example here in a two-dimensional example. Uh, and uh, we have these examples, uh, you know, we have these uh, instances that uh, come with labels. Of course, uh, if, the, uh, if I want to perfectly classify all these examples, maybe I, uh, my goal is to learn some classifier of this kind. That says uh, everything on this side is plus and everything on this side is minus. 
but I don't have that. For some reason or other, another, the only classifiers I have, the only the, my learning algorithm can only produce an axis parallel line, which means I can place lines anywhere I want and move them around uh, in this along this dimension, or uh, I can place uh, lines of this kind and move them around uh, along this dimension this way. And this is all I have. So, in, and uh, you know, the, the, this is all the learning algorithm that I have can do. The question then is, can I somehow boost these uh, weak classifiers, these axis parallel lines and get a strong predictor that does something like this? So a key uh, idea that Adaboost employs is to assign some sense of importance for each example uh, before it's given to the weak learner. Initial, and we'll see how this works uh, later, but the, uh, the intuition is examples that are more important have to be perfectly classified during learning by the weak learner. So initially all examples are equally important. So maybe the, class, the, the learning algorithm will produce this hypothesis. This is, let's say, the best classifier on this data. Um, and it, uh, unfortunately, uh, because this data set is not separable using the hypothesis space that we are considering, there are mistakes. There are three out of these 10 examples uh, are incorrectly classified. Um, so, you know, the error is 0.3. Some, none, there's, there should be nothing shocking about that. Three out of 10 is 0.3. Okay, now comes the fun part. We've made these, uh, so the, this is the end of, this is almost the end of the first round. What, what we've seen is we have a weak classifier, this thing here, and we have these three errors. The next round, what, what, we sh what Adaboost does is it changes the importance of these examples. Remember, every example is associated with an importance. Examples that it got correctly, like these ones, are downweighted. So uh, the picture I have here, the sizes of the pluses and the minuses corresponding to those examples are smaller. So these things are smaller. The examples that it gets incorrectly have been made bigger. So you have these examples that have become slightly bigger. So uh, the intuition is examples that were incorrectly classified in the previous round are made more important for the next round, examples that were correctly classified are made less important, are downweighted. And now we have a new situation. We have a new uh, set of examples. Just a matter of notation, these uh, set of weights that we have at each round, uh, these importances uh, for each example, I'm going to call them DT for the teeth round. You can think of this as a big vector, D, uh, and that's how we'll use it. So DT of I for the ith example is uh, asking how important, how much importance should the weak learner place for this example? It's a number, dt of i is a number. How much importance should the weak learner place on this example in choosing the next classifier? So uh, using uh, the intuition that we had before, uh, dt of i gets increased for these three examples and it gets decreased for examples like these. So now that we have uh, these three, uh, this data set, maybe the weak learner will find a different hyperplane, this one here. Because now notice that it's trying hard to correctly classify these three examples, so it puts the line there. It could have done other things also, of course. So this is uh, now, this is the classifier H2. H2 is the classifier learned on this data, and it still misclassifies these three examples. I claim that H2 has an error of not three over 10, but 0.21. Why is it 0.21? I just made up this number, but why is it 0.21? Because these examples are not all equally important. These examples are maybe their importance is only 0.7. Not of, they are not treated as a full example. Uh, as a result, adding them three, making three mistakes is just uh, three times 0.7 and uh, more uh, formally, 
uh, be, uh, when we are computing the error, we will weight each example by its corresponding dt of i. So these examples, even though they are wrong, they are unimportant examples in this round. As a result, their weight gets lowered. Uh, concretely, the error for uh, uh, boosting uh, for adder boost is defined in this way. Uh, it's called epsilon t for round t is half minus half times some overall examples dt of i times yi hi of x. Let me uh, go through this because uh, this is actually a very reasonable definition, but it's worth kind of unpacking this whole expression. So let's consider two cases. First of all, uh, this line here, by the way, is hi. In this case, it's h2. yi and hi both are minus one or one. So when y equals h of x, that's the first case. When y equals h of x, then you have yi, sorry, when y not equal to h of x, you have yi times uh, xi is uh, negative. It's minus one. Otherwise, yi times h of xi is positive. This is very similar to what we've seen before for uh, uh, perceptron and such things. So this, exp this quantity here is either plus one, if no mistake, on the example xi comma yi, and it's minus one if a mistake on xi and yi. So now we have uh, basically this, the thing in the box that I've drawn is separating the examples, is separating this entire summation into two parts. All examples where there is a mistake, get multiplied with a minus one. All examples where there's no mistake, get it multiplied with a plus one. Um, it turns out, and I'm not, I'm going to uh, uh, let leave this as an exercise, but it turns out that using just that, uh, plus a tiny bit of extra that we will see in a bit, using that plus the observation that the sum of the P of I equals one, we can essentially prove that the error is simply the sum among all examples where there's a mistake of the weights of the examples. So what you do is you go to each example where there's a mistake and you add up their weights and only that much, that total weight of the mistake is uh, consider, is the weight of, is the uh, error assigned to this hypothesis, which is why if these examples were, uh, uh, errors, then the mistake would be the, the total would be much higher because they have higher weights. So you want to uh, uh, find those examples which are low weighted and it's okay to make mistakes on them. In any way, we compute, uh, we can compute this epsilon t. So once again, we play the same game. We notice that there are three mistakes in this round. And uh, we, for the next round, we are going to now update all the importance of the examples. So we had this dt uh, here, and we are now going to uh, uh, you know, change the, d, uh, the uh, this distribution. dt stands for distribution at time t. We are going to create dt plus one by increasing the importance of all the examples where there were mistakes and decreasing the importance of uh, all the examples which were correctly predicted, including the ones that may have been mistakes earlier. Because you know, it, uh, this, these three points were on the correct side of, the hyper, of this uh, line. So the red circles, these three uh, red circles will get uh, up way, upvoted. Everything else will get downvoted uh, for the next round. Essentially, the, what we are saying is, okay, for the weak learner, focus on the three points where the previous one made a mistake. So we'll do that again. So we get this new data set with a new set of uh, uh, weights. In the meanwhile, we also remember all the previous uh, classifiers we have uh, constructed along the way. So now we have the same thing. We'll play the same game. Once again, we'll find a classifier that has a low uh, error uh, and error is defined the same way again. And this time maybe we found this uh, horizontal line. These three examples were important and perhaps that's why the learner, the weak learner picked a horizontal line that made sure that all three of those were negative. 
Of course, there's still a mistake. There are few mistakes here because uh, there's a mistake here, there's a mistake here, there's a mistake here. But once again, when we are computing the error of this classifier, we don't count the number of mistakes. We add up the total importance or the weight for those examples. And maybe that error would be 0.14. Uh, again, this is just a made up number. But importantly, it's not 0.3. It's not, even though there are three mistakes, it's not three over 10 because we will weight each example by its dt of i. So what we have finally is we have these three hypotheses. We have this one here, this one here, and this the third one that we just learned. The final output, so these are our rules of thumb. What Adaboost asks is your final classifier, the combination rule is to ask, uh, you know, when, when a new example comes in, you will ask each of these weak classifiers for what they think their the true label is or what they think the prediction is. So this may be, let's say we have this example, a uh, new example comes in, that's this point here. H, so it's somewhere, all three of these here. H1 might think that this is a minus one. H2 might think it's a plus one. H3 would say it's a minus one. Oh, minus one. And what we have, we've not seen this before, we've not seen this yet, but we'll talk about this later. Each weak classifier is associated with an alpha. Alpha one is the number of votes that H1 gets. It's, a re, it's, a, it's not a number, it's a uh, real number, but uh, think of it as how much voting power H1 has. Alpha two is the voting power of H2, and alpha three is the voting power of H3. All the voted, the the, uh, the votes uh, add uh, are multiplied with the label. Everything's added up. You get a number. You take the sign of that number, which is again minus one of one, and that's the final prediction. So, as an illustration, if alpha one, let's say, is uh, uh, 0 0.7, and let's say alpha two is 10, and say alpha three is uh, Let's make it five. That means the total alpha one H1 plus alpha two H2 plus alpha three H3 is negative 0.7 because this is a minus one plus 10 because this is a plus one and then minus five because this is a minus one, which becomes, uh, I should have, I'm, I'm just gonna simplify my life here and make this one. So this becomes four, which is greater than zero. So the sign of this, so the consensus, the final H final is plus. So what has happened is that the, uh, the this particular example has been classified as a plus because uh, even though two of these uh, weak classifiers think it should be a minus. So this is how uh, uh, the final prediction works. What we have seen so far is just, um, uh, like an intuitive uh, idea. Think of uh, the alphas. Every every weak classifier gets an alpha that the amount of uh, um, uh, the vote that that weak classifier gets. And any boosting algorithm has to when we are in when we are when we are talking about the details of the algorithm, the boosting algorithm has to specify how to produce these alphas. And if it knows if it does that, then we are uh, we are good to go. So. This is like the intuitive version of boosting. Let's look at a more concrete example. Actually, let's uh, now start building the concrete version of uh, a boosting algorithm. In particular, we'll end up with this algorithm that's called Adaboost. We're given a training set with uh, M examples, X1, Y1, X2, Y2, and so on. Uh, all the examples are in some instance space X, and all the labels are either minus one or plus one. Learning proceeds in multiple rounds in, uh, uh, which are indexed by T. At each step, what we will do is first co construct a certain distribution over examples, the DT. This is the importance that this particular round has to give uh, on the examples. And then the learning, uh, then, then all the heavy work is left to the weak learner. Uh, the weak learner has to find uh, a hypothesis, a weak, uh, weak hypothesis, if you want, a rule of thumb um, that has a small weighted error, epsilon t. And then you do this t times, you collect 
uh, you do this capital T times, you collect those many weak hypotheses and you construct the final um, uh, the final uh, output, the, fin the final classifier, H final. Um, this may seem like, uh, th this is the general uh, scheme, but we need to still specify a few things. We need to specify how to construct a distribution over the examples, and we need to specify um, how to construct the final output. This middle part is left unspecified because this is really, you can use pretty much any learning algorithm. You have to slightly modify a learning algorithm so that it produces a weak, uh, a small weighted error. I will leave, I'll let you think about this um, and uh, it's probably worth uh, uh, you know even pausing the video and thinking about this before continuing if you want, or you can think about it offline. So you have these, uh, but uh, as far as Adaboost is concerned, we need to just specify the first, the, this, this, the first thing here, which is how to construct the distribution. And this thing here, which is how do you co combine all these things into a final output? So let's uh, focus on the first one. How do we construct this distribution? Say we have M examples. DT is just a collection of weights over the examples. So it's, you can think of it as a D dimensional vector, uh, an M dimensional vector, one number, for each example. So dt of one would be a number uh, which uh, corresponds to how important it uh, the, the first example is. At each round, the weak learner wants to find examples that uh, wants to find classifiers, the rules of thumb, that has a low uh, error according to these weights. Examples that are weighted high according to this distribution are important. As a matter of, uh, 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 as a practical matter, what we will assume is that these uh, m numbers, d1 to uh, dm, uh, dt of i, all of these add up to one. So that way it's a distribution. So let's see how to do this. Uh, I'm going to build this uh, up in this sort of an inductive way. In the first step, we know nothing. We just, all examples are equally important to us. So we just assume that uh, d1 of i, all for every example for any i, d1 of i is one over m. All examples are equally important. After t rounds, we have uh, some dt. We also have a certain hypothesis that was just learned. And we also have the epsilon, the error of the hypothesis on the training data. What we need is we need to construct a new dt plus one. But what, let's think about what we want from uh, the distribution. We want to find a, in the next round, we want to find a distribution such that in the next round, it encourages uh, mistakes in the previous round to be corrected. Examples that were incorrect in the previous round, hopefully are correctly predicted by at least the next classifier. That way, that region of the instance space would be covered by the next classifier. In other words, what we want to do is we want to increase the importance of misclassified examples and decrease the importance of correctly classified ones. Any, uh, so, so this is like a, uh, almost like a design requirement, if you will, for how to go from DT to DT plus one. DT plus one should somehow downweight, uh, sorry, upweight misclassified examples and downweight the correctly classified ones. Let's see how this works. Uh, what Adaboost prescribes is you, you define dt plus one in the following way. You have your original dt, dt of i, for this is for a particular example, the ith example. Suppose this example was correctly classified, then you multiply it with e power minus alpha t. If the example was incorrectly classified, then you multiply it with e power plus alpha t. And then you normalize everything by zt so that the dt plus one is also uh, adds up to one. Uh, I can combine both of these things because uh, y i times ht of i, ht of xi is either plus one or it's minus one. It's plus one when Remember, it's when y and h have the same sign, it's plus one. In other words, in this situation, it's plus one. So let me write this in a cleaner way. 
in this situation, yi times ht of xi is plus one. In this situation, when there is a mistake, yi times ht of xi is minus one. So I can combine both of these things and say, see, there's a minus here. When there's a minus here, when is there a minus there? When this thing is plus, I want to put a minus there. When this thing is minus, I want to put a plus here. So I can combine this and say, it is dt uh, divided by z, that just comes from here, times e power negate this thing, yi times ht times alpha. So I can compactly say the whole thing is uh, e, uh, d, the, for the next round, the ith example's weight is the its weight from the previous round times e power minus alpha y times h of x, y i times h of x i. The whole thing should be divided by z to normalize the weight. Um, but let's, uh, let's examine uh, why this is a reasonable thing. Remember, our goal was whenever an example was correctly predicted, I want to make its next dt lower. I have not told you what the alphas are, but uh, we will see soon that alphas are always positive. Because alphas are always positive, e power minus alpha is going to be a number that's less than one. Because e power minus alpha is a number that's less than one, dt of i multiplied with e power minus alpha becomes a number that's less than dt of i. So that's the case when there was a, uh, uh, the, an example was correctly predicted. Let's consider the case when an example is incorrectly predicted. In that case, we are multiplying by e power plus alpha. That's this thing here. Alpha is a positive number. Uh, because alpha is a positive number, this becomes a number greater than one because e power zero is equal to one and e power some number greater than zero is a number that's strictly greater than one. So what we are doing is this example was misclassified. So we have for its new weights, we are taking its old weights and multiplying with a number that is greater than one. And so we upvote that particular example. So when this satisfies both the requirements, examples that are Misclass examples that are correctly classified have a dt plus one that is decreased. Examples that are incorrectly classified have a dt plus one that is increased. So uh, just to kind of put all of this together, so the new dt plus one is old dt times e power minus alpha times yi h i h t of i ht of xi. Just note this whole thing is inside the exponent. But that's not it. It's uh, the whole, that thing divided by z. z, as I said, is a normalization uh, constant to ensure that dt plus one always adds up to one. And I'm going to leave it as an exercise for you to think about how to compute the value of dt knowing only uh, this product. So how, sorry, not dt, zt. Uh, the question of how to compute the value of zt given all dt of i times e power minus alpha t y i h t. If I knew this for all m examples, how do I compute the zt? The answer is really you add them all up. zt is equal to sum over all i of the thing in the box. But uh, think about it and try to convince yourself that's correct. Um, the only thing that's left really is what is this alpha? How do we get an alpha that is always positive? And uh, uh, you know, you can there are multiple choices that you can choose, but Adaboost prescribes that alpha should be this number here. If you know that the error in the of the classifier, so we have a certain function ht, which is a weak classifier. Ht of x is a classifier. We also know that it makes an error of uh, epsilon t, which is less than half. It's a weak classifier. It makes it slightly better than chance. If epsilon t is less than half, then one minus epsilon t is greater than half. So one minus epsilon t divided by 
epsilon t is a number that's greater than one because this is this number is bigger than half, so it's bigger than this thing. It's a number that's greater than one, so log of that will be a positive number. Now, why did we choose this? I mean, of course, we could have chosen any positive number. Why did we choose this? It turns out that this particular choice is a rather clever one. This is a choice of alpha that will help us. We won't prove the theorem, but essentially it helps prove the theorem that add a boost works. So this choice of alpha is, uh, uh, is going to be important for the, the theorem. So uh, eventually uh, this alpha serves another purpose. This alpha is used for up upvoting or downvoting examples, but this alpha is also going to be the, the vote associated with uh, HT in the final classifier. So this alpha serves a double purpose. Okay, so what we have seen is in this general scheme, we have seen how to go for how to construct a distribution over examples. The next thing to specify is how do we construct the final output? That's rather simple. Um, so let's see what we have. After T rounds of running at a boost, we would have T weak classifiers, H1, H2, and so on. And we would have T alphas, so alpha one, alpha two, and so on till alpha T. Each weak classifier is, you know, it's a weak classifier, but it's still a classifier. It takes an example and produces a plus one or a minus one, produces a label. The final hypothesis is created by taking all these weak classifiers, weighting their prediction uh, or weighing their prediction, I guess, by the corresponding alpha, adding up these uh, weighted predictions to get a single number that I'll call score or uh, the aggregate score. And if that whole thing is greater than zero, that means uh, uh, this the, 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 the consensus of all these uh, weak classifiers have uh, decided to uh, label the example as positive. If that whole aggregate score is negative, then the uh, consensus is uh, to label this example as a negative one. In other words, the final prediction is simply the sign of all these uh, uh, weighted uh, predictions. So let me uh, put all of this together into uh, a single page to give the full alg algorithm, uh, the Adaboost algorithm. We're given a training set, x1, y1, x2, y2, uh, till xm, xm, ym, we have m examples. Each of these xi's is an instance that's from some instance space. And importantly, all the labels are either minus one or plus one. This is the binary classification problem. Another input to the problem, to this particular algorithm is a t. It's a, it's a hyperparameter. It's a parameter to the learning algorithm. In addition, of course, we may have other hyperparameters that belong to the weak learners that we'll employ. We are also given a weak learner. To start off, we will initialize, uh, we, will, uh, we will set D1 of I equals uh, the uniform distribution. It's one over M. Every example is equally important. And then we start uh, proceeding in rounds. In each round, first we find a classifier whose weighted classifier uh, classification error is better than chance. All we need is it to be better than chance. Um, and uh, it doesn't even have to be the best classifier. It can be just any classifier whose weighted classification error is better than chance. Once we have such a thing, then we compute the vote that this particular classifier gets. So you, uh, for that, you need to compute the error of that classifier epsilon t and then compute the alpha. The alpha is simply half log one minus epsilon divided by epsilon. Now that we have uh, computed the vote, it's time to now update the distribution over the examples. So we go from dt of i to dt plus one of i. And it's uh, what we saw before. Every example, uh, its weight is multiplied by e power uh, minus alpha times yi times ht of xi. Remember, alpha times y, uh, sorry, this yi times ht of xi is either plus one or minus one, depending on whether this example got a mistake or not. Uh, HT made a mistake on this example or not. And this is over the training examples. Z is the normalization constant. 
this is it. These are the steps that are needed for the round. Now we have completed this round and we are ready to go back because we have the D. We know how to, uh, we, we assume, presumably we already have an input which is a weak learning algorithm and it uh, finds a rule of thumb for the next iteration. We do this as many times as needed. We do this T times and uh, that gives us T weak classifiers and we the final hypothesis that, uh, that's returned by Adaboost is essentially all these alphas and h's because when a new example comes in, when this new example x uh, comes in, the way the prediction is done is each ht is given the example, it's asked for the label, all the, la all the labels are weighted or weighed by the alphas and uh, the aggregate is, uh, uh, the sign of the aggregate is the label. Uh, in the toy example, just to uh, remind you, we ran this process for three rounds. We got three edges, three hypotheses. Each of these is a weak classifier. Either it's a vertical line or a horizontal line. Each of these was uh, combined with uh, a certain weight called alpha. And uh, on the new example, you take the sign of these uh, weighted words. The interesting thing is, even though each individual uh, weak classifier was either a horizontal or a vertical line, by combining them in this way, you get something, you get a decision boundary that is outside the hypothesis space that you were originally considering. And this is why boosting, is, uh, boosting works. And this is why in general ensembling works. An ensemble may have a decision boundary that is not in the set of uh, functions that you were originally considering. And as a result, we can build up these complicated decision boundaries. So what we have seen so far is just the mechanics of the algorithm. Let's now spend a few minutes talking about why this algorithm works. Um, there's a theorem that comes, I, I mean, anyone can invent, anyone can come up with uh, a heuristic and say that if you run this, things will work. But the nice thing about Adaboost is it comes with a theorem. It comes with a theorem that says, if you run this process for T rounds, where each uh, weak classifier really has an error that is uh, uh, equal to half minus gamma, where gamma is a positive number, epsilon T is half minus gamma T, and all the gamma T's are less than some gamma. If this happens, then the final, the, the final hypothesis that we construct has a training error that drops exponentially with the number of uh, iterations that you run this process. So the training error drops rather quickly. Gamma is a positive number. So this e power minus two gamma square t is going to drop very fast as t increases. Uh, this is a, uh, what this theorem says is the, the, the fact that epsilon t is half minus gamma t and gamma has this gamma t is less, uh, is, has this property, just is another way of saying we have a weak learner. If we have a weak learner, as the number of rounds of boosting increases, the training error drops exponentially. That's basically what the theorem is saying. The proof for this theorem is actually rather simple. Uh, it, it's a little bit intricate uh, in the sense that it involves some algebra, but conceptually it's rather simple. Uh, you can see the class website uh, for a pointer to the proof. Now, something to think about, about this theorem. It's a statement about the training error. And uh, it's worth thinking about, is it enough to upper bound just the training error? This, this theorem says nothing about generalization. So why should this be, um, why should this uh, be helpful? Remember, uh, our VC dimension theorems and our, our, our path uh, in the case of agnostic learning, we had, uh, theorems that said, if certain properties hold, the generalization error won't be too far off from the training error. And that's why uh, in this particular case, uh, we are okay just bonding the training error. If you want uh, to see what this actually looks like, the epsilon t, sorry, the, the, the error of the training, the H final uh, drops really fast. It, the theory says it drops exponentially fast and you actually observe this uh, on data. The training error drops exponentially fast, even though 
each individual classifier, each epsilon t might actually be, get, be getting worse. So this particular, uh, uh, the, the, the second plot that I just showed is actually a plot of epsilon t alone for this particular, this is the, at the 40th iteration, this is the error of that particular weak classifier. But at the 40th iteration, the combined classifier has a zero training error. Another interesting thing to note uh, with this particular uh, 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 with this particular uh, uh, algorithm is uh, the theory tells us that the training error will keep decreasing or it will reach zero. That's what the Adapus theorem tells us. But the test error, the generalization error, can actually go up. Why? Because the final classifier, as we keep adding more and more weak classifiers, the H final can become too complex because each weak uh, classifier adds one more uh, layer of complexity if you want. And as a result, the test error can actually overfit. In practice, however, something curious often happens. This is not a guarantee, but often happens. The uh, training error drops to zero and the generalization error, the curve on top, does not seem to go up. The in fact, even perversely, the test error may even decrease sometimes uh, after training error hits zero. And there's this fun paper from uh, Shapir et al from 97, which has an explanation about how, uh, in fact, running this process for more iterations actually might increase the margin when for uh, defined in a certain way. So let's uh, quickly summarize Adaboost. What's good about it is that it's a rather simple algorithm. There's only one extra hyperparameter, whatever hyperparameters your weak learner had. In addition to that, you have this one more thing, which is the number of rounds. You can use this with any weak uh, learning algorithm. All we need is uh, we need to find classifiers that are slightly better than chance. The caveat is that uh, the performance of this thing depends on the task that you have because there's no magic uh, in this thing. And it also depends on what you use for weak learners. Uh, this whole thing can fail if your weak learners are too complex, your weak learners are not weak, because what will happen is you'll very quickly overfit. It can also fail if your weak learners are a little too weak, because that means you'll have to run this uh, thing for way too many rounds, uh, you are essentially underfitting. You are unable to, the, the weak learners that you have, and even the complex full, the H final that you build is not expressive enough to capture the concept. Empirically, there was this line of work from uh, Rich Caruana and his students around mid 2000s that showed that uh, boosting is actually a rather useful thing to uh, add a boost is a very useful thing to have in your toolkit. Boosted decision stumps in particular at that time were among the best things to try when you have only a small number of features. Um, uh, and this, this was the result of a massive set of experiments that compared uh, uh, many, many, many different classifiers, many different learning algorithms on many different data sets. And they found that boosted decision stumps were surprisingly good all the time. So it's a good thing to kind of uh, think of as uh, a classifier or a family of classifiers to uh, sell. Now, what, uh, we, what we've seen so far, we've seen what boosting is, and we've seen the mechanics of add a boost. Now we will generalize this whole thing uh, to talk about ensemble methods in general. And in particular, I'll talk about this, uh, I'll revisit boosting is from the perspective of ensembles um, and then talk about bagging and random forest, which are just two other techniques for ensemble. In general, ensemble methods are meta algorithms that combine the outputs of multiple classifiers uh, to produce consensus outputs. These methods tend to be empirically rather robust and they invariably tend to improve performance. And uh, for production systems, ensembles are really helpful. Uh, a, a popular uh, instance of an ensemble winning the prize was uh, in 2009, Netflix organized something called the Netflix prize, which uh, said they wanted uh, a machine learning system or any system that can rate movies or that can recommend movies better than their in-house system. And uh, they offered a million dollars to any one or any team that can do it. And it turned out the winner of this uh, challenge was uh, a, a giant ensemble of multiple teams that just decided to group together. Um, in fact, the name of the team, if I remember right, uh, was something like the ensemble. 
um, ensembles are going to be a very useful tool, as I said before. And even for your class project, you can think of using ensembles because ensembles just become new classifiers for your uh, uh, class project. A boosting is a kind of an ensemble, or it produces an ensemble. Uh, we saw this thing, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You at uh, in, in the beginning, you just uh, weigh all examples equally. And uh, it, in each iteration, you produce one element of the ensemble. Um, and uh, then you, uh, you this model that you train on the weighted training set becomes one element of the ensemble. And uh, um, then you keep, we, the, there's this whole game around regulating the weights of these examples. You can run this for hundreds or thousands of times. And you, uh, and in the end, you create this carefully weighted prediction uh, where each individual model in the ensemble is, uh, uh, is assigned a certain weight. There are different ways of thinking about boosting. I said before that uh, there is some argument that add a boost uh, uh, um, plays with the margin a little. Uh, there are connections to uh, a certain family of logistic regression. Uh, it's, a, I, it's actually a linear classifier. It's a linear classifier on top of all the weak models. So boosting is also a weak model, uh, a linear classifier, it turns out. Um, another ensemble that's rather popular and super easy to implement is called bagging. Bagging is short for bootstrap aggregating. And this uh, uh, is from Leo Bryman uh, from 1994. It's super simple. Imagine that you have any classifier, any learning algorithm. Let's call that uh, you know, the, the output of that C, CI. What you do is you're given a training set of M examples and uh, you repeat a certain process many, many times. Here it says M times, but in practice, you can do a different number of times also. At each step, what you do is you pick a certain number of examples with replacement from the training set. You draw a certain number of examples with replacement from the training set. Now this collection that you have right now becomes your training data. You train a classifier on the set of examples. That is your classifier CI. You do this many times, you get many classifiers. Each CI, when you are, so this is the, that's it. You return the final, the set, and that's the end of value. In, eventually, at deployment, the way you make, uh, you, uh, you assign labels for new examples is each CI votes on the label for the new example, and you take the label that has the highest number of votes. Um, and uh, if you want, uh, uh, if you want to do a regression, uh, you can just take the average over uh, the output of each CR. If you are doing classification, you take the, the most common label. Um, it's a general method. It's like, it, it, notice that this algorithm does not care about what learning algorithm you use for training this classifier. It's a general method for just uh, making your classifier more robust. Um, it, it aggregates multiple versions of the same family of classifiers. Notice that every time you draw this particular set of examples and train a classifier, you might get a different um, uh, classifier. So it tends to, uh, these, the, this way of uh, constructing examples, uh, data sets with replacement is called bootstrap, creating a bootstrap replicate. So that's why you have uh, this, the name of this thing is bootstrap aggregating. So essentially you just create multiple bootstrap replicates of the training set. And on each bootstrap replicate, you train a classifier and then you aggregate the predictions either by averaging if it's regression or by taking the most common label if it's classification. Uh, it turns out bagging is uh, uh, really, um, uh, it's really good. It, it, on, it, it's, it's a very, easy tool to use. Uh, I mean, you can, even for your class project, you can just very quickly implement bagging on top of any other learning algorithms that you've uh, seen so far. Um, it turns out that if bagging is especially helpful when uh, your training set, when your classifier is sensitive to which training set you use. So if making minor changes to the training set can cause big changes to the uh, performance of the classifier, then in some sense, bagging smooths over all these things and it, it, it gets rid of this instability. Uh, as an example, you can use, uh, you can create bagged decision trees. You create a bunch of bootstrap samples of the data. 
and you train using say ID3 uh, to produce those many trees. And then the final prediction is either the average, I'm showing an example here uh, of uh, regression with the tree, just to kind of remind you that trees can be used for regression also. Uh, each of these things makes a prediction. So this comes from here and this number comes from here and you just average the thing and that's your final prediction. You can think of, there's another version of, uh, uh, there's an extension to this idea of bagging called random forest. Random forests are extremely widely used. It's a fantastic tool to have in your toolkit. Remember in bagging, what you did was you created multiple bootstrap samples of the data. But each time you use the same set of features. For random forests, in addition to creating bootstrap replicates, which means sampling examples with replacement, you also sample a subsample, all the features that are available uh, for that particular subset, that particular split of the data. So using the set of examples that you have just drawn, plus only those features that you have subsampled, you create a tree or uh, it's called random forest. That's why it's a tree. Um, so you create a tree and you do this thousands of times, many times. And the pretty final prediction is exactly the same. If it's classification, the tree, every tree that you train gets a vote. If it's, uh, gets one vote exactly. And if it's regression, you average all these things. Once again, random forest is super easy to implement and I encourage you, strongly, strongly encourage you to try this out. Okay, this, is, this brings us to the end of this lecture. Um, we've seen boosting in ensembles. Boosting in ensembles are an important, ensembling is an important idea uh, that's worth uh, keeping in your toolkit. Um, we started this lecture with this question about boosting. In particular, we started this lecture with this question that came from uh, essentially a, a theoretical uh, thing. Does weak learning imply, weak learnability imply strong learnability? The answer is yes. And add a boost is a constructive answer uh, uh, for this uh, thing. So weak learnability implies strong learnability and how you use add a boost. You just uh, employ add a boost to kind of build up your uh, uh, composite hypothesis that can be that uh, that can have an arbitrarily small error. Boosting is a special instance of a wider family of methods that are called ensembles. Uh, other things that we have in this family are bagging and random forests. Essentially, any method that uh, combines multiple uh, classifiers to build a consensus label is an ensemble method. Ensembles are a very useful tool, as I said, to have in your toolkit. Ensembles will, uh, in, they tend to invariably make your classification accuracy more robust to uh, minor perturbations in the data. The cost, however, is uh, in order to build an ensemble, you may have to run your uh, learning algorithm many, many times. For random forest, for example, you would have to train thousands of trees or thousands of decision stumps of certain depth limits maybe. And so essentially you have to do more work upfront uh, computationally, but you tend to get better results. All right, this is a good place to stop. And uh, uh, hopefully I uh, you do use ensembles for uh, anything that you do.